I'm Francesca Maxime. And I'm Matt McClure. And this is Currents. With unemployment at a new high, where can you turn? We'll look for some answers. If, you know, someone feels like they're in crisis or if someone feels like they're having a really hard time dealing with that impact, to, to seek out help. A song and a saint. It's a little sister at Lincoln Center. She was forgotten, she was ignored, um, but now she's recognized. And we'll meet a woman who's practicing her own kind of health care reform. I had always wanted to take care of the poor. Well, good evening and thank you so much for joining us this Monday. It has been a tough economy since the end of last year. A lot of us know this firsthand. Finding a job doesn't appear to be getting any easier. On Friday, the government reported the unemployment rate rose to a 26-year high of more than 10 percent. According to the New York Times, the number is even higher, 17 and a half percent, if you also count people who've stopped looking for work. Yeah, it's a, it's a dire uh, set of numbers there. But this is no time to give up, though. Help is available. Catholic Charities Brooklyn and Queens, as a matter of fact, has a number of programs to assist the unemployed. Mm -hmm. To find out about that, I spoke earlier on in the day with Sarah Suman and Erin Carmen, both with Catholic Charities here in the Brooklyn Diocese. Well, Erin, Sarah, thank you so much for uh, both being here and taking some yes. time out to join us today. Absolutely. We appreciate it. Now, Erin, um, I'm going to address the first question to you. Um, with the rise in unemployment, obviously, you know, dismal numbers out here recently. We just learned a few days ago that the uh, unemployment rate, 10.2% uh, in, in the nation for the month of October. Um, it, it's not looking good, especially as we approach Christmas time. I mean, you know, things just, the, there's good news and there's bad news, you know, in the economy. Have people been coming to you in greater numbers to Catholic Charities and greater numbers seeking help since the economy has uh, begun the downturn? Yes, so we've seen an overall increase in clients seeking assistance, especially clients seeking assistance for the first time and clients who've been laid off in the last year or so. Yeah. What kinds of increases have I mean? Has it been you haven't been? Have you been overwhelmed, or has it been the things that you could handle, or that? Well, kind of? staff are typically overwhelmed, but um, the the prime needs that we consistently see are eviction-related cases, food needs, and unemployment. Okay. Job-related issues. Gotcha, gotcha. Now that's of course something that. Um, as we approach the Christmas season, as I mentioned, that, that, that is on everyone's mind because, you know, I mean, it's a time where people like to be able to give. And obviously, if you don't have a job, you might not be able to give. Mm -hmm. What kinds of services does Catholic Charities offer? And whichever one of you ladies wants to, to um, answer this, which, what kind of uh, services does Catholic Charities of Brooklyn and Queens offer for folks who might be out of a job? Well, overall or during the holiday season? Um, any time. Well, overall and during the holiday season specifically, too. Okay. Overall, I, I'll speak for the community centers. Overall, there are community centers offer case management assistance and food pantry-related needs, and on a case-by-case -case basis, limited financial assistance, um, typically related to housing eviction issues. Uh, during the holidays, we're offering um, food packages for Thanksgiving, and we do a toy drive for Christmas. Okay, well, great. Well, that'll be, that'll be very, a very nice thing to do. Now, um, I know that, um, uh, Sarah, you, you do a lot of work, I think, through the Matthew 25 yes. uh, project. For folks who might not know what that is, mm -hmm. explain it to us. Sure. Uh, the Matthew 25 project uh, rolled out at the beginning of this year, and the intention was to um, provide parishes with the opportunity to apply for uh, small amounts of money, um, to respond in a creative way to the current economic crisis. Gotcha. And so we had a lot of parishes applying to supplement their pre-existing food pantries. And we were hearing from parishes that they were seeing uh, anywhere from a 25 to 100 percent increase in the numbers of people asking for food assistance, emergency food assistance, um, which I know that that uh, the community center pantries are also experiencing, mm -hmm. and um, and so, but one of the one of the more creative ones, um, and and distinctive ones was out of uh, Queen of All Saints, and that was um, the where the jobs panel, and it it was directed specifically at looking at how do we help people who are out of work. Yeah. Now, I remember so. we, us uh, covering that here yes. uh, on Currents, and yes. it, was, it was a very informative session. Any more events like that coming up? Any more sessions uh, mm -hmm. such as that? We, we actually would like to work with parishes more to put on those kinds of events because we're, we're equipped to do it, and we would, we would love to be able to. And I continue to uh, let, let parishes know um, that, 
that they can always reach out to us and that that's something that we can offer. And also when we attend cluster meetings and in other, for the parishes, we let them know too that they can always come to our community centers um, or their, their parishes, they can refer their parishioners to come and we can link them to the resources that we have with different community groups um, that provide, whether it's job training or um, resume writing and that sort of thing. So. Okay. We definitely we're equipped to do it. We yeah. don't have anything in the works yet, <laughs> but we're absolutely equipped to, to ready, help. ready and willing, yes. and and waiting to do exactly. it. So, exactly. Exactly. Very good. Yes. Well, um, Aaron, I know that recently yes. you, uh, uh, in your work, completed a survey mm -hmm. of the needs of uh, some folks in the community. Tell me about that survey and what you found. Sure. At the end of September, we did a we did a survey for a two week period um, to everyone coming into the community center who was willing to come to complete the survey. And we did, uh, we received 111 responses back and found that the top needs requested by clients were related to, in this order, uh, basic computer skills workshops were requested, um, unemployment or employment related skills, job search skills, and thirdly were tenant rights. So we're, we're in the process of um, starting a workshop series in our recently opened computer lab in our downtown Brooklyn Community Center to offer basic s computer skills workshops and in conjunction with Sarah's initiative hopefully some employment related information as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, Well very good. What advice uh, might you guys give to folks who are looking for a job right now just in general? I can, I can start with that. Um, I think what I would, what I would do First, I mean, one of, the, one of the things that we've been trying to address is, um, or that we want to address with mm -hmm. some programming is the emotional toll and the, the psychological toll that job loss can have on people and on families. So if, if, you know, someone feels like they're in crisis or if someone feels like they're having a really hard time dealing with that impact, to, to seek out help. And not only does seeking out help get you maybe what you need in the moment in terms of addressing a crisis situation, but it also uh, begins uh, the process of being connected and networking and right. getting to know what, what resources are out there. Um, I mean, and I would say, and I hope Aaron's okay with this, <laughs> I would say come to our community centers yes. because, because they, can, they can work with a, with a, uh, a case worker who will mm -hmm. put them immediately in touch with resources. And we, again, we're connected with um, and work with the Fifth Avenue Committee, which is right out of Park Slope, and they have a variety of different training programs right. and training programs that will put people directly into job placements. Um, Aaron works with the HOPE program, which is another, mm -hmm. another program that helps people with that. So, I mean, again, I, there's, there, there's a lot of, there's a lot that goes into, to, I, and I understand someone that's looking um, for, for work. And right. so there's sort of the practical piece, the need for, you know, Right. The job, and right. then also the short term and the long term. Exactly. Needs. So exactly. Okay. Right. Well, and and definitely a place to find it in Catholic Charities Brooklyn and Queens. Yes. We'll link to uh, your uh, website and give any other contact information on our website, Great. and uh, we'll have a link up to that. So, uh, Aaron, Sarah, thank you so much for being here today. We really yes. appreciate it. Pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Sarah Suman and Eric Carmen of Catholic Charities Brooklyn and Queens there. And uh, I do have more information up on the blog, as a matter of fact. Uh, CurrentsNY.net, you can uh, get some information there on how to get in contact with uh, mm -hmm. Catholic Charities Brooklyn and Queens and, and get the help that you need if you are uh, searching for a job. Riding the wave is where it is. So. It is so hard. A lot of my friends are still out of work. They've been out of work since maybe September of last year. And, uh, you know, they keep trying. And, uh, you know, you can just only hope. And like you said, the mental toll it takes as well right. in addition to just the income not being there is really tough yeah the sh in you know you gotta, gotta focus on the short term and the long term mm -hmm. and I mean that the mental part of it is really you know the short term might be okay how am I gonna put food on the table or pay the yep. rent well the long term is the mental toll that it takes you know on you being without a job and like that's that. why it's nice to be able to reach out to groups like this for all those kinds of resources that's it. well stay tuned there's much more current straight ahead when we return the speculation is over the Vatican releases the details of how large groups of Anglo Republicans can convert. We'll have that and the rest of the day's headlines. Welcome back to Currents. I'm Matt McClure. And I'm Francesca Maxime. Coming up just a bit later, as lawmakers in Washington try to reform health care, a local doctor is doing her part by helping the homeless. But first, let's have a look at the day's headlines.
We now know exactly what Anglicans will have to do if they want to become a part of the Catholic Church. As we hear from H2O News, the Apostolic Constitution, which sets out the rules for conversion, was released today. A specific canonical structure has been prepared for Anglican clergy and faithful who wish to enter the Catholic Church. In fact, Benedict XVI's Apostolic Constitution, entitled Anglicanorum Cetibus, was just published today, November 9th. The Constitution was previously presented at the Holy See's press conference, which these images refer to. The document introduces a canonical structure that establishes personal ordinariates, which will allow former Anglicans to enter full communion with the Catholic Church while preserving elements of their distinctive spiritual and liturgical patrimony. It provides for the ordination of married Anglican clergy as Catholic priests, though precluding the ordination of married men as bishops. The agreement was reached with the Anglican Communion, and it represents a further step in the ecumenical path traced out by Vatican Council II, which the Catholic Church is resolutely determined to follow. In an article published by Lo Servitore Romano, the rector of the Gregorian University, Father Gianfranco Ghirlanda, noted that a flexible canonical structure is now introduced and that, just as the Holy Spirit guided the preparation of the apostolic constitution, it will likewise assist its implementation. Here in the U.S., a similar structure known as the pastoral provision has been in place since 1980. Pro-life groups are enjoying a victory after this weekend's passage of a health care reform bill in the House. An amendment preventing the use of federal funds to pay for elective abortions, sponsored by Congressman Bart Stupak, was approved before the bill was passed. That amendment was supported by the U.S. Bishops Conference. The bill now moves into the Senate, where Republican Lindsey Graham is declaring it dead on arrival. The major bone of contention in the Senate seems to be the government-funded health insurance option. The U.S. soldier accused in a deadly shooting spree at Fort Hood, Texas, is awake and talking. Army Major, Ma Army Major Nadal Hassan had been in a coma since last week's incident, in which he is accused of killing 13 people and wounding 30 others. Meanwhile, churches around the Army base held vigils for the victims this past weekend. Reporter Samantha Hayes has more. On the altars of churches, both inside and outside Fort Hood this weekend, prayers for the victims of the shooting and their families. Thirteen wooden crosses, thirteen candles at St. Christopher's Episcopal Church in Colleen, and retired Army Sergeant Victor Sanchez lays a rose next to one. Everyone in this town is sad, very sad. That doesn't supposed to happen here. Like his fellow parishioners, Sanchez is looking for answers, seeking support. You all have people close to you who are hurting because of this. Bind up their wounds, carry them, and then let me carry you. Gracious Heavenly Father, we are grateful for your presence. At Fort Hood, Garrison Chaplain Frank Jackson led his congregation in prayer, and not just for the family of the victims. Lord, we pray for Major Hassan's family as they found themselves in a position that no person ever desires to be in. At the Comanche Gospel Church on Post, Chaplain Jason Blake intertwines faith and a familiar military tone. Our focus today is on resiliency and that the Army, we're Army strong and um, we're going to be, we're, we're, we're our focus is on recovery. Recovery will be difficult for people like Sanchez, who continued to question how something so tragic could happen in Colleen, Texas, his home, Fort Hood, his family. It's my hometown. I live here. I got business here. I belong to this church. You know, all my friends is here. Samantha Hayes reporting there. And an Austin newspaper reports hundreds of worshipers gathered at St. Joseph's Catholic Church near Foothood, Fort Hood for a memorial service. President and Mrs. Obama are scheduled to attend another service tomorrow. The U.S. Bishops' Conference is allocating nearly $8 million to help struggling U.S. dioceses next year. The money will assist 87 dioceses in the U.S., its territories, and former territories. The funds will mainly go toward evangelization efforts, religious education, and training for priests, deacons, religious, and lay people. Stay tuned. There's much more currents coming up straight ahead. 
Coming up, look out, Andrew Lloyd Webber. There's a new musical about a new saint. I want them to see this saint who was a very humble, hidden woman who did so much good and to realize that everyone can do that. Last week, I spoke with one of the composers of a musical on the life of one of our newest saints, Jean Jugan. She is the foundress of the Little Sisters of the Poor. When Glenn Moore first wrote that musical titled The Hidden Heart, little did he know that one day it would be presented at Lincoln Center. But that is what happened this past weekend. And we sent our cameras. Have a look. We're here to honor our foundress, Jean Jugan. She was canonized on October 11th of this year, and today we celebrated her life through music and song at Alice Tully Hall. It was a wonderful, a very moving event. The French Revolution is raging. All institutions are suspect. Churches are closed. Religious are in mortal danger. King Louis needs his faith. Into this world, Jean Jugan is born. I want them to, to see this saint who was a very humble, hidden woman who did so much good and to realize that everyone can do that. She did it in her own humble way. She was forgotten. She was ignored. Um, but now she's recognized and we see that her holiness can bring all of us closer to God and it can bring us closer to the poor. Our times are not very thoughtful towards the elderly, and they can easily be forgotten, neglected, put in nursing homes uh, because it's convenient, because everybody's busy. Um, she tells us don't forget them. Give them happiness. They're, um, we're all one family. We're all in the same, the same bread line. We're all going towards our Lord together in the same family, and we have to help each other, and the elderly are no different than anyone else. Glenn Moore has been with us for many years. We started in 2005 when he asked if he could ever come and play and sing at the Christmas Eve Mass, him in the chorale. I happened to be the Mother Superior at the time and I, I told him he'd be most welcome. It started a friendship, and then he also has presentations like for Lent and Advent. Uh, also, like during Christmas, uh, he has a special presentation on the angels, and also during May. So whenever he had these presentations, he would call me and say, you know, do you want us to come over and do it for the residents? Because a lot of times the residents can't get out. Like, you know, if uh, they were more able, they would be there. but. Uh, due to infirmities, handicaps, they're not able, but Glenn always thought of that and he always wanted to take the first step. A year ago, their mother general came over from France to celebrate her 50th anniversary. She's the first American woman elected the uh, mother general of the order and Mother Margaret Charles said, could you do something, put something together for her? So we thought about it and we thought, let's do something on the life of Jean Jugan, their foundress. And after we did it, people loved it so much, they said, when, when, not if, when Jean Jugan gets canonized, you should do this in the city, you should do it at Lincoln Center. And I was like, oh, of course, I'm sure I'll be there at Lincoln Center, I'll see you there, you know? Never thinking it would really happen. And another miracle, you know? We, we've just had so many miracles and, um, you know, here we are at Lincoln Center. Resounding applause. Right. It's nice to see that that was such a success, too, because, I mean, Glenn Moore does some great work. Obviously, some great composing as well. Mm -hmm. 
and um, Mother Margaret there, who I also interviewed, was part of that piece. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's great to, to have seen that come full circle and all the way to Lincoln Center. It's awesome. Come to fruition, especially when years of dedication and, you know, there was such the effort, obviously, for right. Jean Chagant to be canonized, to, you know, to become a saint. And now that she is, they've had this sort of capping off that because that yeah. was just, you know, a month ago or so. So it's a really nice uh, denouement to the whole story. The proverbial cherry on top of the Sunday. Yeah, right. <laughs> Always That's bringing it. it back to the food analogy, well, Maddie. You know, I, uh, I can't help myself sometimes. <laughs> Stay tuned. There's more current straight ahead. Coming up, this doctor is helping the less fortunate by dedicating her work to homeless patients. It's not just the physical illness that has to be attended to. Every individual has physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual parts. Finally tonight, as the Senate takes its turn at reforming health care, we want to take a look at a local doctor who's doing her part. Elizabeth Lutash is a trained cardiologist, and while she could be making a lot of money working in a hospital, she's chosen a less lucrative career, but still a very fulfilling one, ministering to homeless men and women in Manhattan. And that is why tonight she is our salt of the earth. Well, Elizabeth Lutash, member of St. Teresa's Parish and a very active member of the parish, very involved in all kinds of different things. But as you mentioned, she is a doctor. Um, she's a cardiologist, was her original specialty, and then developed a specialty in AIDS. Um, she's worked most of her life as a doctor um, with homeless people in the city of New York uh, out of various clinics connected with St. Vincent's Hospital and uh, really has dedicated her life to that. Well, I never actually did work in hospital except for one year after my training in internal medicine and cardiology. I spent one year and I knew it wasn't for me. I had always wanted to take care of the poor. Oh, her heart is so huge. It's, it's such a beautiful, beautiful heart. She's an amazing woman. Um, never ever has a bad word or, or a bad um, thing to say about anyone. This is no sacrifice. This is pure blessing, a pure grace from God. Every single one of my patients is a blessing. And the um, I don't even know what word to use for it. It's not work. It's, it's a grace from God. But it's God pouring out his love. And with them being in that short talk, I met Elizabeth Lutash as my doctor there, and she gave me the news that I was HIV positive. And it freaked me out to know, and she just helped me. She cared. Because some doctors you can deal with, they'll just tell you, oh, you got HIV, and walk out the room. She told, she'll talk to you and tell you, yeah, well, this is what's going on with you, and explain it to you. She don't treat you like you stupid. She'll explain it to you. You know, right down the line. And she shows that she cares a lot. It's not just the physical illness that has to be attended to. Every individual has physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual parts. And all four of them are interrelated. And if you take care of only one, you're not healing the whole person. By her being a devoted Catholic helped me to deal with a lot of spiritual things that I was going through at the time. More like dealing with the, the, the anniversaries of my mother's death. More like touching with God, getting closer to God, because at, the, at that time I found out I wasn't sure. My faith was like on, going up and down, I wasn't sure. But, but through her, I'm more strong now, and I'm more into the faith, because she's willing to help everybody, not just me, she helps everybody. No matter what, no matter what color, skin color, or whatever, she's willing to help everybody. And that's, that's what I look at her as like Mother Teresa. Really, she should be a saint. So many of them have said to me, you've turned my life around. And I always say, I, I don't think it's I who've done it, it's God who's done it, and we've all been there together. That's yeah, awesome. I mean, yeah, you know, she could be making more money somewhere else, but she says, what she's doing mm -hmm. is not a sacrifice. She doesn't see it that way at all. She right. sees it as complete and total fulfillment and a gift from God that she's able to do the work that she's able to do, which is obviously helping a lot of people. 
she reminds me a lot of my mom. You probably knew I was going to say yeah. that. But, you know, honestly, I mean, she started the first homeless shelter for women in Boston. She's been a physician for the last 43 years. And she does that kind of work. I mean, I remember she would have homeless people come live with us. She would minister to them health-wise and otherwise in our home when I was a kid growing up. And she still does that kind of thing on medical missions. The point being about Dr. Lutash here and about people like her, of which there just seems not quite enough, is that they just give and give but see that it is the great of God going through them that enables them to do that kind of work yeah. and they are thrilled and happy and honored to do that and to give that and that's what's so beautiful. Yeah it really is and she recognizes that you have to treat the whole person mm -hmm. not just the physical but the mental the spiritual as well so mm -hmm. it's it's a complete package. It really is it really is. Well that is all for this edition of Currents. Tomorrow we'll meet a local man who's also helping in his community. He's using his own time and his own money to feed immigrants and the homeless. Another great story that and more to tomorrow here on Currents. But until then, remember you can always watch us online. The address is CurrentsNY.net. And you can also follow us on Twitter. Just go to Currents or Twitter.com slash CurrentsNY. So for all of us here at Currents, I'm Francesca Maxime. Tweet, tweet. Mm -hmm. I'm Matt McClure. <laughs> Thank you so much for watching. Have a great night. I know you usually say the Twitter thing. I don't usually say it. I'm like, I